is currently the entrepreneur in residence uh, at the David and Helen Burley Brown Institute for Media Innovation. She's also a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist and New York Times bestselling author. Alan Soon is co-founder and CEO of Splice Media, which supports the development of viable uh, media startups in Asia. Uh, Dale Cohen is the special counsel uh, for Frontline and director of the UCLA uh, documentary film. And uh, our moderator today is Anya Shukran, the director of the technology, media, and communication specialization at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, as well as a senior lecturer there. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. I will pass it to Anya. Okay, great. This is on. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think this is the third time in my life that I've been in LA. Um, complete New Yorker, so I never get out here. And um, <laughs> it's exciting to have different conversations. Ditto being involved with the law school, I think that's great that, you, that the law school is joining the conversations that journalists and philanthropists and so many governments have been having for so, for so long about how to save journalism. Um, I think I'll start off with just a couple of sort of framing remarks. Um, I think Courtney Radish has been really like at the core of a lot of the policy making and a lot of the debates and has brought together a, a real group of experts in the room. I'm so excited to see Joe Donovan here. And um, I saw Sophia Noble on the program and I've always wanted to be in a room with her too. So, so thank you very much. I think um, I'm so glad that you mentioned both disinformation and quality journalism in the same breath because I, they're obviously very connected. And um, when I teach my students about these two sub subjects, these are actually the two topics I teach about, I always say I simplify things. And um, when I think about disinformation, I tell them that there are two categories of solutions which overlap. There are the demand side solutions, which are educating audiences to consume quality information. And that would be things like media literacy, building trust in journalism. And then there are the supply side solutions, which are all about the supply of information. And that can be either suppressing, like through shadow banning or hate speech laws, or through supplying quality information, promoting quality journalism. So I view um, all the discussion about how do we help promote quality news and information as a key supply side intervention in the fight against disinformation. Um, and then when we start thinking about that, we look around the world and see how many legal interventions, policy interventions there are now around the world. And I think your report, which I read, and is absolutely terrific and summarizing a lot of this and making proposals. That would include things like the Australian News Media Bargaining Code, which is forcing Google and Facebook to pay for news, which can then lead to problems of capture or inequity, which I'm sure some of the panel will be talking about. Um, all of the funds that have been created both by governments and by philanthropists. I think what Alan's work is doing is a really key because you're on the front line with smaller independent outlets. So is the documentary work as well, making sure that this alternative important quality information that's so relevant um, is, is, is available. And then of course, Julia has been working for years in scrutinizing big tech and has been sort of a forerunner telling us to worry about things that we didn't even know we should worry about. I mean, you were talking about privacy really before anybody else was. I mean, 15 years ago, you were writing about this, you were writing about racial bias as well. So I think um, that there'll be a lot to unpack in terms of kind of addressing the problem over the next couple of days. And I, I think that this very knowledgeable panel will be a good place to start. And again, in the world of philanthropy, in the world of journalism, in the world of you know, sociology, communication, scholarship, we've been having these conversations for years. So I just think more, more lawyers, the better. It's like economists. We need those perspectives on these, on these problems. Julia, should I start with you? Um, sure. Yeah, um, it's great to be here. And thank you um, for uh, just how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> right? I've been for so long. I remember when I started writing about privacy. Um, everyone was like, what are you talking about? Like, what is, I, I launched a series of um, investigative articles in 2010 at the Wall Street Journal called What They Know, and really the whole idea was, 
what do these three people who are tracking me along the way? I know about me. So it turned out like a lot. And um, if everyone was kind of like, huh, that's weird. Why are you worried about this? <laughs> and um, I feel like I could run the same series of stories now, and it would actually just be worse. And people would be more mad, actually. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the tracking has not been much worse. And uh, you know, the thing is that I'm um, a tech reporter. I grew up in Palo Alto, in Silicon Valley, and I learned to code in fifth grade. And I was actually going to work. I studied math and computer science in university, and then I was going to go into the tech industry. But I found it to be um, somewhat hostile to women. <laughs> um, my boss took me to Hooters every time for lunch. And, you know, I just, it was yuck. So I thought, I'll just do journalism. I'm working my college newspaper. It's super fun. So I'll do that for a little while. And so I ended up going to journalism and found that uh, over time, I was one of the only journalists in the newsroom that had tech expertise. And so as tech became a real factor, I became a tech journalist. And what I discovered as I was writing about technology is that um, it was actually killing journalism. Like this was the thing that was so shocking to me. When I started writing these stories about privacy, they were really about online advertising. And online advertising was really about, as you all know, surveillance, watching what you do and following you around the web. And what that means is, at the time I was writing about this, I was the Wall Street Journal. So the Wall Street Journal at that time was really well, well, being huge profit margins, like lots of foreign correspondents, investigative team. And the reason we had all that was because ads were really expensive in the Wall Street Journal. And why were ads really expensive? Because if you wanted to reach a middle-aged white guy who golfed and was a middle manager and had a BMW, that is how you got him. And so you had to pay a premium to reach that guy. And then surveillance advertising came around, you didn't you could track that guy around the web and find him on some random site that was much cheaper to buy an ad on. And that's really to me the heart of this problem is that these two things are related. The lack of privacy in the online advertising economy is actually what transferred all the money out of journalism into online advertising. So in the past decade, uh, the newspaper added Revenues in the US went from 20 billion to 10 billion. And online ad revenues went from basically zero 20 years ago to almost 200 billion. So we're at this incredible mismatch. And so when people talk about, like, oh, the crisis of journalism supply demand, that is all true. But like the real truth is, it's just a sinking financial ship, right? Really solve it without addressing the financial problem which is there's no money in this business. It used to be supported by advertising, and that has collapsed. And subscription, it seems like it's been pick, is picking up some of the slack, but not a lot. And so we really have to think about what are the ways to support journalism, because you can't have it without money. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So you know, a lot of the proposals, though, make me nervous, right? Because as a tech reporter, the idea of Things like bargaining codes, where you, you know you actually negotiate directly with a company that you cover, and they are financially paying you to do the work you do. That is a recipe for conflict of interest, right? And so it's very hard for me to imagine ever being able to have that kind of negotiation as a person who's been an adversarial investigative reporter about big tech my whole life. And so I worry about that as the solution. And so I often raise in these areas, the idea that government funding should be a little bit less um, scary than it. right now. Most newsrooms in the US, most journalists I know, would never take their money. They, they're like, you know, censorship, you can't do it. And I understand that legacy, right? But they're all taking money from Facebook and Google. And so it's kind of like, I'm not saying either one is awesome, but like, <laughs> you have to take money from somewhere. So I put that out there as a prov provocation. I'm, I think there, it, either way, the money has to come in a way that is independent so that um, if it's from Facebook and Google or from the government, there has to be some sort of independent body that like is separate from those entities and, and distributes it in some way. There are models for that in Europe and other places. But I do think that like we are in a crisis and journalism is not going to survive <laughs> if we don't figure out how to
a lot of things I want to say in response, but I don't want to hog the time. So maybe uh, Alan or Dale, would you like to come in here? Oh, sure. um, so I've, I've got very similar views on, on this one, right? I think that at some point you have to figure out where you're going to get some of that money from. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're absolutely right in saying that there's no, there's no right or wrong in a lot of these cases. It's really a question of how you can preserve your, your ability to stay, to stay independent of all that. Um, so, you know, over, over the past couple of years, we've been seeing the effect of the Australian uh, bargaining code on the rest of the world. And this is created, right? Um, I think that that's a very uh, problematic um, assumption that, that the code makes around um, compensation or reparations, as I would like to call it. Um, I think that we are, we are very confused to who's responsible for the downfall of our business models, right? And we're, we're too quick to, to pin the blame on, on big tech companies because we're assuming that that's the easiest one to go after. Um, but look, this is a transformation that's happened over the last 10 years. It's not new, right? We've seen this coming. We saw this at the, at the outset um, when, when people started to, you know, consume information off their phones. You know, this has been a long journey for, for all of us. And here we are, you know, in 2023, talking about how to go about penalizing uh, big tech companies for the impact that they've had on a business model that we all know right now doesn't exist anymore. And yet this is a conversation that we're still having, which which baffles me. Um, and I think that's where you know our our interest lies. I think the the struggle with with believing that you know the news industry or broadcasters have suffered at the hands of big tech has led us down this really horrible road of us trying to protect these business models that don't exist anymore. When, when, you know, where here we are in 2023, we've got a whole generation of people who've never bought a newspaper in their lives, who've never gone home to watch the 70 AM news that I used to write, well, the 60 AM news that I used to write as well, you know, on, on TV. All of this stuff has changed and we're still having the same conversation. So I think that's, that's my point of view on this. So then where do you think, I mean, we don't have a lot of choices, right? It's going to be foundations, it's going to be government, it's going to be audience, or it's going to be big tech. You know, corporate taxes. So, which none of them are perfect, but they all have trade offs. So, which what are you proposing? Then? Are you seeing better audience? Yeah, I would, I would actually say a lot of this has already been proven, right? So, we were just talking earlier, Julia, about, about YouTube and what that's, what that's like as a starting point for you know, anyone in, in journalism, right? If you were to start a media startup today, I would say get on platforms, figure out how the algorithms work and build a great product for an audience that wants what you're saying, right? The internet is a demand-driven platform that is very niche and allows you to create niches. So that model has existed for, I don't know, let's say five years at least, right? You know my books, it's a 200-year-old model. <laughs> well, that's right, the is a 200-year-old model, right? I mean, the niche newsletter yeah. is from the 19th century, yeah. Fantastic. And that's See a radical transformation in the way we look at some of these things. We are there in existence, and we see, you know, creators making the most of that space. YouTubers, Instagrammers, TikTokers have all figured out how to do that. But we in media refuse to have that conversation because, you know, that's they're not journalists. But I think Alan. So this is interesting. If you're saying basically that there is online. And YouTube, then that would argue that they do have some responsibilities, just in the way that television and you know got spectrum and had to do public service broadcasting. Absolutely, and I think that's the, the important thing to, to note here is that even in a in a group like this, I don't think there's a single YouTuber here or an Instagrammer or a TikToker, right? And the reason for that is that as as the journalism community goes, we don't we don't offer them the same respect. We don't have a we don't have engagement with them that's substantial. It's easier for us to say, look, you know, you guys are not journalists, how would you know? Right? And we keep that arm's length. And because of that, we don't learn from them and they don't learn from us. And I think that's where the problem is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm delighted to agree with Alan about, uh, about almost everything that he just said. Uh, and I'm a little surprised that we got there so quickly. 
uh, <laughs> because I, I know most of the agenda is talking about the supply side, to mm -hmm. use your terminology. But my experience working in all these different sectors, because I've worked in corporate media, I lived through the downfall of many newspapers once upon a time. I, I now work in the public sector with Frontline on PBS, is that that demand is really the issue. Um, I'm without, so I think that, that everything I've seen in 30 years now plus of, of working with media is that where, where the audiences are, the money will follow. Whether it comes from the corporate sector, whether it comes from advertisers, whether it comes from subscriptions, and, and it may not be as good as it once was. I was at the Chicago Tribune when it was held out as being you know, the model of success because our profit margin was the highest of any newspaper company. It may not ever get back to there, uh, but the money will flow where the audiences want to be. And I, and I think that, that Alan's exactly right that, that pinning the blame for where we are, and in particular trying to restore the glory of the newspaper era, it is, it is really a fool's errand at this point. That, that what we need to really be talking about, and, and frankly, it's a little bit of audience surveillance. I mean, where newspapers really failed, based on my experience, was that we didn't know our audiences. And, and you hear it now from many of the media companies who say, Part of the problem with the platforms is that we don't have the direct connection to our audiences. We don't have the data. Um, and I think that's important. I think the New York Times has demonstrated that, that there is success out there if you get to know your customers really well and you provide them what they want. The New York Times has largely restored what was the newspaper model once upon a time. And it's not all journalism, although great journalism is an important key aspect of what they've done. But they bought games, they bought Wordle, they, they have cooking, they have um, the athletic now. What they've done is they've brought back the audience by saying, here, we understand what it is that you want as a lifestyle, and we're making ourselves essential to you, starting with the daily podcast and all these other things that, that bring people back to the brand. The journalism comes with that. But you can't make people eat broccoli. <laughs> You know, they, they, have to, they have to either ex, be exposed to it or they have to want that, and, and we have to make that attractive. And it's only by re-establishing that link and giving people what they really want, I think that we can restore the health of journalism. Can I jump in? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, as an investigative mm -hmm. journalist, I would just say that there has never really been audience demand for our product. Thank you. Um, essentially, um, there are lots of parts of journalism for which there is audience demand. But investigative is a public service. It's sort of like taking out the trash. Mm -hmm. It is, you want something to take out the trash, but do you want to think about the trash? No, you never want to think about it, right? And that's how investigative is. We dig through really boring stuff, and we write about really boring things, like qualified immunity, incredibly important problem, and one that a lot of investigative um, words have been spilled over. But most people do not want to read a story about qualified immunity, which is basically the legal protection. I don't have to say that this reminds me, I'm assuming you all know, but legal protections that police officers get, which means that they, don't, they can't be held liable when they murder people. And that's a really big problem. Um, but there are problems that are way even less sexy than that, right? That I write about all the time. Like my, some of the most important things I've done are about algorithms. Algorithms are super boring, it's the word is boring. And then we talk about <laughs> You talk about, okay, this algorithm is giving unfairly heavy weight to one thing versus another. So my best known story of all time is about a criminal risk score that has an error rate disparity. So it has a false positive rate for black defendants that is twice as high as for white defendants and a false negative rate, which is twice as high for white defendants as black defendants. Are you awake still? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so my point is this is an incredible service, but it is not sexy. And so the reason that the newspaper model worked for accountability journalism was because they had excess profits. Because they were monopolies, they had excess profits that they could put into these high prestige um, types of journalism that got them awards. And that was a virtuous cycle. They could say they had awards, etc. 
But that cycle has broken down, right? Because basically, the Times can still afford to do investigative journalism, but as we all know, local newsrooms cannot. And all these like startup newsrooms, I just founded a newsroom, the markup, that was doing um, investigative journalism. It is very hard to get funding to sustain that type of work and incredibly hard to get audience for that. And so I just want to say that investigative is a public service and it might, it's worth thinking about whether it be funded as a public service. And, and I guess my reaction to all of that is you're right about the local news side and we should probably dig deeper on that. But I work for Frontline. We do boring documentaries about all those subjects you're talking about, but they're not boring. Because what we've done is we've adapted to the audiences. We figured out that, that that seeing these things in film, and I work with documentary filmmakers at UCLA at our pro bono clinic, who are making interesting films about these really niche and, and strange stories. And audiences do come. They don't come in the mass that, that, that we used to get for big newspapers. I agree with you about that. But we have a very strong audience. And now the front line is on YouTube, we're seeing an explosion of audience. They well, must have had a lot of foundation funding those documentaries. They weren't a real Sure, I, I, also, again, I, I, I'm- Also, is the front part of public broadcasting? It, it is, I'm, I'm, <laughs> but we're talking about demand, we're not talking about supply. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm talking about the, the demand side of things. Demand means market, letting them, I, I, I think that Julia's right, that if we let the market, if we let audiences determine, then we're gonna end up with a lot of, we're not gonna end up with the broccoli. I mean, yeah, but yeah. actually, I, I disagree with that. I think the public funding comes because there's an audience that demands these documentaries. I, I think you're wrong if you think otherwise. You know, the, the fact that, that there's an audience is what we go to Congress with or that PBS goes to Congress with, or we go to funders and, and foundations and say, look, there's this big audience that wants the broccoli, that wants the investigative journalism, and we're delivering it in a fashion that even younger people aren't following even though they don't know what it means to, to pick up a newspaper and get ink on their fingers. And I think you're right that there is a demand for quality um, video in particular. Um, and certainly on YouTube, you know, there are creators <coughs> like said, who, who do things that probably could be considered investigative journalism. And we <coughs> do need to have a clearer idea of like how we define what journalism is. But I they need help and they will always continue. That tips over a policy conversation. That's what we're we're also talking about, right? If we if we take a view that that the internet is niche, it is always going to be user uh, driven. How many people do we need to get that piece of information before it becomes a thing? Right? And I think if we apply our old uh, school mentality around this, would be you know, the have it on the front page, have it on the A one, <coughs> make sure everybody sees it. Make... That was how we would have positioned it. But now, you know, how many people do you need to uh, you know to get this piece of information out to if it starts moving, right? And now I would I would say that we have uh, because of the use of platforms. We have a better ability now to target that information to those who can actually act on it. So I think that's also an important factor. We don't need a mass audience to make change happen or to you know to, to serve this mission. Well, I think that was always the idea of the op-ed in the New York Times, right? We've done surveys at SEPA for Human Rights Watch of what do people at the UN read, and it turns out that actually an op-ed in the New York Times really doesn't have a yeah. But as, as you both point out, the accountability piece, unless there's NGOs, unless there's a legal climate, unless there's an entity that's accountable, doesn't matter how many people see that information, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so documentary filmmakers talk all the time about impact. Yeah. Uh, exactly. and, and that's exactly what they're thinking yeah. about. And certainly what I know my colleagues at Frontline are thinking about all the time. Um, and you're right, it's publicly funded and supplemented by foundations and private donations. We, we need all of those things to, to support the documentary industry. And goodness knows the documentarians aren't making money from the platforms or the technology companies. They, they get peanuts that way. Uh, but you're right that, that, that if you can attract people to these stories, and, and Julia, I, I urge you, take some of your stories, you know, come to, come to Frontline, go to documentary filmmakers, 
where I'm working right now on a film about quantitative easing. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> As we go to interview people, they're saying they're making a documentary about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it does work, but Alan's right. It, that's not going to be a mass audience. Netflix isn't going to buy that film. <laughs> I, would, I would definitely want to see that documentary. Say off that. to Julie on the bargaining code, I, one thing I did want to say, and I know we'll talk more about capture, is that the whole when we talk about the power imbalance, the whole idea of the bargaining code was to correct the power imbalance. Because what the Australian Competition Commission said was that the outlets can negotiate with the platforms, but if they cannot come to an agreement, then it will go to arbitration with a government chosen mediator. So the whole idea was to make sure, as Rod Sims would say, that the small, you know, the outlets knew the government was at their back. And the other point that was key about Australia was that both sides had to come in with their final offer so that a huge Google couldn't drag a little small news outlet through five years of bargaining. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think some of the problems that you raised were, you know, I'm not saying by the way the news media bargaining code is the solution that will save journalism. I think that's a mischaracterization, but I think it can, you know, it's put a lot of money into journalism in Australia and a lot of jobs have been created and a lot of smaller outlets have benefited as well as large ones. So I think it's not gonna happen everywhere. It's not happening in the US, but you know, Canada may pass it. As you know, Brazil looked at it, like where it can be done. I think it's a, it's a good thing to do. I just have to say like as a journalist who's covered tech my whole life, I just, the idea that like the solution is to like, for like the outlet that I found at the markup to do a get to a cage match, literally just get into a room yeah. with the company that I cover mm -hmm. and an incredibly adversarial to and like negotiate for my future financial success is so insane. Right? <laughs> I just I really I understand that like in theory maybe this has worked, but I just I don't really understand why it had to be these one-to-one -one negotiations. Like, isn't the entire point is like Normally, these things would go into another fund and be distributed. So, I think what Emma did in Australia was bring in a class for the second set. So, the Murdochs went one on one because they're huge and powerful, but Emma brought in, I think it was 80 smaller outlets and had them negotiate as a group. I mean, clearly, you probably feel much more comfortable getting money from a foundation yeah. than yeah. from Google. So, yeah. you won't. But, I, you know, your point. Spend a lot of time, you know, Africa, Latin America, and it's so interesting there because outlets that will take money from George Soros, they will take money from Gates, they will take money from USAID or DFID or Swedish Foreign Aid, they'll take money from like all different organizations and foreign governments. If you say, how about your government makes a list of outlets and gives them all a tax deduct, a payroll tax deduction so they can hire more reporters, you know, like the Canadians have done, and everyone will go, no. Absolutely not. I don't want the government to make any decision. I'm like, wait a minute, you're taking money from all these foreigners, but you don't want your government. So, so it's clear that it's going to work differently. Yeah. And I think the Swedish model, you know, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Scandinavia, although they had all these great ideas, like we'll fund the second largest newspaper in the second city so that there's a diversity. We'll fund, you know, local film, right? All these, all these ideas to sort of expand pluralism. Now you have a conservative government that's been voted into Sweden, and everyone's saying, oh my God, are they gonna start funding things like their equivalent of Pink Slime and, right. and Far Right? I'm in a project right now, which I can't even believe I'm in doing. 11 years ago, the government of Bhutan, the king said, we need to move to democracy. We're gonna support all these local newspapers with advertising. So my students and I did this like study from Australia, Argentina, India, Canada, and a bunch of other countries. And we came back and said, don't do it. This is how you will end up having control of those outlets. Do not, you, you want to support media, great. Don't support, don't do it through government advertising. Um, and if you do do it, there's a lot of things you should be doing. Like don't put any government advertising in your election periods. Don't um, you know make a clear distinction between this is where you get your COVID vaccine and isn't the mayor great? He's giving everyone a COVID vaccine. A lot of countries, Argentina, Australia, have multiple problems with this model. We said to Bhutan, don't do it. Well, guess what? 
New York, and then, then we got even more data, right? So then we've had all the academic studies of what happened in Czech, Hungary, Turkey, all of this has now been documented by The Economist. Well, guess what Mayor de Blasio did in 2019? Signed an executive order to give municipal advertising to ethnically owned outlets and outlets owned by people of color. So theoretically, this is a disaster. Right? We've had 10 years, you know, 20 years of experience from around the world shows us it's a disaster. But you know what? It's giving some money to the Haitian Times, and it's all we got right now. So this, I think, is what's the reality around the world. It, it's what we got. In Australia, got some money from big tech. In New York, it's a little local advertising. In California, it's going to be some fellowships. That's what we're dealing with. We're not Sweden. You know, we're not Canada, unfortunately. I mean, it's all money. Right, <laughs> right. Like all the money is comes with downsides, and so yeah, I think I, I guess what I hear is like that that you need a lot of guardrails, right? And so in every situation, the more guardrails the better, and that's where that one-on-one -on -one negotiation just feels like you want a lot of guardrails. That sounds like you're saying that putting them in. Yeah, yeah, lots of people have good guardrails, but again, if Trump gets elected, all your guardrails are over. Yeah, Alan, um, I can't, I, since I haven't seen you since the pandemic, um, can you just give us a little picture of how some of these things are playing out in your part of the world? I know Indonesia is actually starting a news media. That's right. I experienced so, that. What are the cards? If we were at a, at a conference in Singapore right now, time, what kind of conference, what would be people be saying? What do you want to see happening over there? Oh, that's a good question. I think, um, I think for, so Singapore has, has a very different model in this, in this case, as you know well. Um, Singapore's moved its, its, monopoly newspaper, which has dominated the space for forever, uh, into a public trust, putting public money to support them, right? So that's that's one way uh, that that is playing out. Um, I think the, the understanding with with the Straight Signs, which is the, the main newspaper in Singapore, the understanding is that you need the Straight Signs to continue to survive. Um, as a when when the Straight Signs was part of a uh, publicly listed company, they struggled greatly to remain relevant while at the same time credible, right? And in a, in, a, in a political climate like Singapore, it's very hard for a newspaper to, to assert um, independence from government policy, government influence, government work, right? So I think that's, that's one of the, the reasons why the Straits Times have to be moved into a public trust to protect it from the fact that nobody would go out and buy the newspaper download the PDF version of it, <laughs> buy a digital subscription uh, to a service that everybody knows uh, speaks what the government says, right? And I think that's where the challenge is. Um, in the case of Indonesia, I, I find that one really quite surprising, to be honest, just because um, in the case of the Australians, the Australians have two major issues that are dominating this conversation. What is it? You know, what was it for, for Indonesia where you have a multitude of, of conglomerates, not just, you know, not just two, but uh, at least five major conglomerates running that space. Um, what's in it for them to be negotiating for something like this, um, you know, in 2023, right? I think that's, that's really quite interesting. Um, also, uh, you know, Indonesia has the traditions of, of public uh, internalism the way Australia has. Or, or, the, or the institutions behind it, uh, even though I think that the Australian case is still very much commercial, uh, um, you know, mindset. Um, but yeah, that's that's what we've got across the region. And you know, the, the funny thing is that the rest of the region is still struggling greatly with how to to uh, to put this together. The public broadcasters, every country kind of has some kind of public broadcaster uh, service out there. Um, that's been challenging, you know, as, as you can imagine, a time like this, uh, when when um, people have moved off, uh, you know, traditional rock papers, you know, that conversation is still not being had in a lot of, of countries, which I find quite surprising, because that leaves a whole space open for a lot of misinfo, disinfo kind of work um, that's out there, and also business opportunities that could have been done. Um, but you know, like like everyone else, I think the, the region looks toward what has gone on in Australia and asks themselves, you know, is this the right approach for us? Super interesting. 
And um, I want to get to the audience, but Dale, I can't resist. You were talking about local news, and you were giving us a tempting uh, preview of some of your documentaries. Are you working with local outlets around the country to get ideas, or how to, can you talk to us a bit about the process? Sure. Well, we, we run a pro bono documentary clinic here at UCLA that, that's open to independent filmmakers. Um, some of those stories are very local. Some of them are, are wide open. Uh, you know, we choose them based, it, to be perfectly honest, partly based on, on what's best for the students, what's going to be most interesting for the students. We're also training the students at the same time as we're providing the support for, for the filmmakers. And, and things just come to us. But one of the things we've discovered, and it's sort of the flip side of what we've been talking about, is that free is the most powerful word in the English language. Uh, certainly for documentary filmmakers, they come to us because they're looking for legal support and help, and, and we want to help them tell these stories about these communities that, that haven't been covered. But there's only so you know, we have limited bandwidth. I, I too would love to be able to figure out a business model or a, a funding model so I could do every documentary that comes our way, but, but it doesn't happen quite that way. Uh, so local is, is clearly a very big problem. Having worked in the newspaper industry and having seen what's left of the newspaper industry now and, and what a shell most of the, the local newspapers have become, either because of consolidation or dis disinvestment, it, it's very troublesome. So we look for stories that we think will impact uh, communities that are not being served, whose stories are not being told by filmmakers who are not otherwise able to raise money. Um, just because we help them though and, and provide them the help without them having to, to bear the legal cost doesn't mean they get distribution, yeah. and, you know, which is a yeah. different problem. So I can't resist saying that this year I decided I'd teach something fun. So Sheila Cornell and I drew up a syllabus for a course called Journalism in the Movies. Ah. And we are having so much fun. Sorry folks, I have to watch two movies a week now. <laughs> <laughs> And we have PhD students, undergrad. Oh, I, I'll share the syllabus. So anyone yeah, wants to, to teach a it. course like that, it's just so great. So I bet um, on that note, what would anybody from the floor, I don't know, Courtney or Emma or anybody else want?